Hello and welcome in a new season of the Women of Power podcast. I am Angie Murin, in charge of communication for Cesare. At Cesare, we're all about leveling the playing field for men and women in the professional area. And guess what? International Women's Day is just around the corner, giving us the perfect chance to chat with some incredible women leaders in our industry. So go ahead, connect with their stories, and let's all find the keys to building a fairer and more equal society. In this episode, we have the pleasure to meet Oriane Valdelievre. Hello, Oriane. Bonjour, Angie. Hello, Angie. Together, we'll discuss Oriane's journey, exploring the challenges she faced as a woman, the actions she prioritizes to promote equality and diversity, and she will share advice on overcoming our own obstacles and limiting beliefs. As a theory, we are convinced that being able to confront all point of views is a way to grow. To do so, I invited collaborators to join the conversation in this new season. We'll meet them at the end of the interview for the last question. But let's start with getting to know you. Oriane, you are Head of Claims of Formation for the Europe and Asia Pacific regions at AXA Excel. Could you tell us more about your journey and its progression to your current position? Of course. I would say that since my studies in business school, my career has unfolded in three phases. I chose to start it in consulting, first at KPMG in France, and then at the broker Aon in London. At Aon, I participated in launching the strategy consultancy offer to reinsurers, and I worked mainly for a syndicate in the Leeds market. Then, I wanted to return to France and go to an insurance company on the client side. So seven years ago, I had the opportunity to join AXA headquarters, where I worked in the business development strategy team. I was in charge of leading the strategic dialogue with our French and European subsidiaries, participating in defining the three- to five-year plan and responding to the challenges of the CEO and the board of directors. The third step got me joining the subsidiary AXA Excel, which is dedicated to major risk for multinationals. And the objective was to participate in the transformation of our claims management activities. So I aim to improve the satisfaction of our customers, employees and brokers while simplifying our operations through new technologies, the use of data and the review of business processes. Thank you, Oriane, for sharing this. An impressive and very rich journey. I will now move on the second question. As a woman, what obstacles and stereotypes have you had to overcome to thrive in your company and in the world of work in general? I would say that there are really two distinct types of obstacles, external ones and internal ones. External rounds are those that we know best. They are linked to the company or the team. Based on my experience, it can be the lack of inspiring female leadership models to better identify and grow, but also non-inclusive behaviors where individuals monopolize the conversation, ignore women, or treat them as secretaries. And finally, and this is probably the most disturbing, the sexist jokes, and the boys' club atmosphere, which is what happened to me in a team that was almost exclusively male. These obstacles are significant for women, and luckily, businesses have been working on them for years. But there are also internal obstacles that women impose on themselves, and that should not be underestimated. They are not specifically related to women, but are more commonly experienced by them. I think it's mainly because of education and culture. And I am going to give you a few examples that applied to me early in my career to start with. The first example is excessive modesty, particularly in the way I communicate and the fact I'm doubting my worth. I found it challenging, for instance, to speak up in meetings or highlight my successes in my annual review with my manager. Another example is perfectionism. I always felt the need to refine and continue working very late. There is also saying yes to everything I was asked, by managers or colleagues, and compensating for the work of others. Mainly, I believe, to be liked and avoid conflicts. 
And finally, another example is never asking for a raise or promotion. I think I struggled to identify the implicit rules within the company for advancement. Faced with these obstacles, I managed to flourish. Firstly, because I believe I was fortunate to have managers who appreciated my contributions, many of whom were actually men. They also promoted me, highlighting what I could do and bring to a team. This confidence allowed me to improve my self-confidence and understand how I could contribute. And secondly, I think I learned to proactively address these obstacles. I believe this is a part of the maturity I gained early in my career. Indeed, these obstacles are infinitely quite common, maybe too common. In your opinion, Oriane, what actions should we take to promote women's access to leadership positions and create a professional environment that is not only diverse and inclusive, but also more equal? To begin with, I believe that companies have played a very strong role in this matter for several years, with significant progress, especially in the insurance sector. However, it is probably a very ambitious challenge considering that the issue go far beyond the business world. As I mentioned, I think it generally stems from culture and education. So I would like to share perhaps a statistic that illustrates this, specifically in the private sphere. I read in a study conducted over 20 years ago that 80% of women report spending at least one hour per day on cooking and cleaning, while only 30% of men do so. I think the key issue here is that these numbers have not changed significantly in the past 20 years. And so, it is something that companies unfortunately can hardly influence. But based on my experience, I would still like to share some beliefs about the measures that company can take or reinforce beyond the traditional talent and mentorship programs for women that are quite common in large corporations. First point, continue to measure and set goals for the number of women in leadership positions, as well as at all levels of the company to improve the pipeline. Also, promote women, especially in roles traditionally held by men that lead to leadership positions, such as underwriting, distribution, finance, and do not limit yourself to functions like human resources or communication. And finally, offer training to employees to identify their strengths regardless of their position and help them work on storytelling, kind of what is generally done in the Anglo-Saxon environment. Very interesting. Thank you, Orian. What have you implemented to overcome your own obstacles and limiting beliefs? And how have these efforts contributed to accelerating your professional advancement. Now, I will share with you some examples of concrete actions I took to overcome the internal obstacles I described earlier. To gain confidence in myself, I regularly force myself to speak up in meetings, especially to advocate for my team. I also seize the opportunity to be a speaker at conferences regularly addressing audience of around 100 people. Then, I consciously removed some of the barriers I had set for myself regarding how I dressed. At the beginning of my career, I really wanted to align with the colors and the simplicity of the dress code, which was primarily blue and gray suits for men in our industry. Over time, I chose to listen to myself more and wear much brighter and more feminine colors. While this may sound symbolic, I really believe it contributed to feeling more like myself in the company. I also organized peer coaching sessions with three colleagues to discuss leadership challenges and benefit from an outside perspective on what is okay or not okay to accept or ask. It's a small circle of really supportive women, which allows for guidance from people who know the company well. And finally, I talk to inspiring women and men about my challenges. At AXA, we are fortunate to have a network called MixIn that organizes 30-minute session one or two times a year with leaders involved in diversity. 
Each time, I truly seize these opportunities. I strongly believe that we should not wait for someone to assign us a mentor. Instead, we should actively create relationships with people who can help us progress. In fact, I am convinced that this can be done at any level with individuals who genuinely care. I would like to take this podcast as an opportunity to mention that, for example, I have learned a lot from the courage of my younger sister. Looking back, all the work illustrated in these examples allowed me to be more assertive, aware of my value, and ultimately understand how to think and act to progress in the corporate world. Thank you, Oriane, for this very inspiring speech which I also personally agree with. Now, let's continue with the fifth question. What would you have liked to know when you started your professional career and what advice would you have wanted to receive? I have three pieces of advice that I wish someone had given me when I was early in my career. According to a study, performance, which is crucial early in your career, actually accounts for only 10% of professional success. So my first piece of advice is to make sure you allocate time and energy for your visibility, network and communication. And advice number two, proactively work on your self-confidence. Learn public speaking, engage in theater, find ways to regularly step out of your comfort zone and prove to yourself that you can succeed without overworking. Advice number three, learn to say no and set your limits. This applies not only in your professional life, but I would say especially in your personal life. It will definitely reduce frustrations and improve your overall satisfaction. Thank you, Oriane, for these valuable tips. I am now pleased to welcome Nicolas Faure, who is Brinchon's legal counsel at Cesare. Hello, Nicolas. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. I would like to ask both of you a question to gather your perspectives. Given that stereotypes can hinder gender equality, do you believe we should emphasize these potential differences between so-called masculine and feminine leadership to revalue the latter? Or should we move beyond this debate and redefine our conception of leadership? Who wants to start? I am going to start. I would say that, yes, there are differences between what can be called masculine and feminine leadership. However, these differences are not a bad thing for feminine leadership, quite the opposite. Perhaps there is a perception of difference because we still lack equity in terms of how many men and women access to management positions. But for me, leadership should not be a question of gender, but a question of competence. So what is more interesting is to focus on the concept of leadership today rather than opposing the feminine gender against the masculine gender in management. Personally, I am convinced that the type of leadership value today is truly authentic, transparent and empathetic. It is a leadership that cares about the well-being of employees and is explicit about the company's imperatives. We can see that, especially in the age of social media, information circulates faster, making transparency crucial. And simultaneously, issues of purpose and values are essential, particularly for recruiting younger generations. These characteristics align closely with what has been traditionally labeled as feminine leadership. However, based on my experience, it's not the leadership of all women, and it's not exclusive to women. In fact, it is the leadership style of some men as well. I believe we need to move beyond the distinction between masculine and feminine leadership and encourage both women and men to find their own path, to learn to develop a leadership style that aligns with their personality and sets them apart. Thank you, Orian and Nicola, for opening up about your experiences and insights on gender equality. I found this discussion incredibly valuable brimming with practical ideas for taking tangible steps. If you haven't already, I highly recommend tuning in to all the episodes of the Women of Power podcast. There, 
you will uncover the unique journeys of remarkable women, each making their mark in various ways to contribute to a more just and equal society. If you had a good time listening to this episode, let us know. You can subscribe to the podcast, give it five stars, and leave a comment on listening platforms. Thank you very much. Bye.